Okay, hello all. We're going to give people a little time to join and we'll start in about a minute. Okay, hello, can you hear me? Anyone respond or make a movement on the screen? Hong, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Hey. Thank you. So why don't we get started? Um, the session today is um, on behalf of the PGC Substance Use Disorders Working Group. Um, and uh, the overall topic is Emerging Insights into the Genetics of Substance Use Disorders. And this is a recent photo of the people from our group um, who recently came to Anaheim. So um, our group started its official action in 2015. And uh, since then, we have um, had some good scholarly output. So far, our marquee publication is the Walters et al. G. Loss of Alcohol Dependence that was the cover story in Nature Neuroscience a bit over a year ago. Um, we have several other very good papers and some ongoing work which you're about to hear about. Um, and I'll just point out that um, at the um, World Congress meeting, Raymond Walters, who you see um, in the lower left of the inset, was able to replicate um, the cover. And other people have been able to replicate the actual findings from the paper. So what's up in PGCSUD group? Well, our alcohol paper is gathering sites very nicely. Um, we have some other papers out, as I just showed, and other, others under construction, including several cross-disorder analyses, item-level AUD analyses, cannabis GWAS, and analyses based on polysubstance use phenotypes. So before we get started, I just want to point out two things. First of all, we have a sample size problem. So, if others in PGC have collected SUD phenotype data information, we very much welcome and encourage collaboration. And I think many people have this for alcohol use disorder, but perhaps for other substance use disorders as well. So, if you're able to work with us, we would like to hear from you. Also, like much of the PGC, we have a population problem and that most of our results are from European ancestry. And I just want to illustrate that a little bit and show you where we have the state of the art for alcohol use disorder. So first of all, for European ancestry, and Hang Zhao is about to discuss this in his talk, so I'm not going to give you many details other than say we have 29 independent risk loci and we have some very interesting post GWAS analyses. In contrast, for alcohol ancestry, only one locus, sample size only a bit over 60,000. And in Asian ancestry, even smaller cumulative sample, two loci, loci, both alcohol metabolizing enzymes. So we've been able to show convergent mechanisms, but we only go beyond alcohol metabolizing enzymes in European ancestry subjects. So we have a lot of work to do for populations other than European ancestry. And just these are the totals here, two Asian, one African, 29 European, I hope we can do better in the next iteration of PGC. So with that, I will just describe the upcoming presentations and I would like to ask that people reserve questions until the last of these presentations. And uh, the first talk will be Dr. Hang Zhao, Associate Research, Research Scientist at Yale, talking about meta-analysis and problematic alcohol use in 435,563 individuals. And Hong, please take it away. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Hong from Yale. Today, I'm going to talk about um, meta analysis of problematic alcohol use, um, combining data from MVP, PGC, and UK Bank. 
and this study was posted online. First, I would like to introduce uh, the background of alcohol use disorder. Uh, AOD is the leading cause of death and disability worldwide, and actually the chronic relapsing brain disease have, uh, have been a lot of uh, symptoms. And it's comorbid with many otherwise consequences, for example, um, major depression. However, only a small subset of patients received any treatment. Here is the current stage of knowledge about the genetics of alcohol use disorder. Uh, AOD is um, a heritable disease with moderate heritability. Um, before GWAS area, there are several genes um, are known to be associated with, with alcohol use disorder. For example, ADH1B and ALDH2, those are the two uh, major enzyme, enzymes uh, play a role in, in the alcohol metabolism. In recent years, there are a lot of GWAS studies have been done since 2011. Here, I list some of those important studies, and I would like to um, highlight three studies later because we use the data from those studies. And those studies extended our understanding, and there are more genes have been confirmed uh, to be associated with alcohol use disorder. The first study I, I would like to emphasize is from Ryman in 2018. It's a study from PTC, uh, it's combined um, 28 cohort. The phenotype is DSM-4 defined echo use dis uh, echo dependence, and the total sum size is more than 50,000. Uh, it's studied two um, populations, European and African ancestries. The second study is from Sanja uh, in 2019. It's from UK Bank and 23, 20, 23 and Me. The phenotype is alcohol use disorder identification test uh, for problems, short for audit P. The total sum size is more than 140,000, and it's only European ancestry. Uh, one, one, one of the important um, uh, message delivered in this study is that alcohol uh, audit P is different from audit C, which is the measurement for alcohol uh, consumption. The third study is uh, our study last year. It's from MVP. The phenotype is ICD-9 or 10 diagnosed alcohol use disorder. The total sum size is almost double than previous study. And we studied all the five major populations. More and more evidence shows that alcohol use disorder differs from alcohol consumption genetically. Al alcohol consumption, which means drinking quantity or frequency, for example, measurement by ODC or drinks per week. For example, um, in our study, uh, it shows that the genetic correlation between alcohol consumption and other traits is opposite from the genetic correlation between alcohol use disorder and other traits. Um, and there are more studies um, uh, talking about this topic. Uh, so in this study, we only focused on alcohol use disorder and closely related traits. Here we call it problematic alcohol use, PAU. It's combined uh, alcohol use disorder, alcohol dependence, and ODP from different cohorts. Fewer studies have focused on PAU than uh, quantity frequency measurements. For example, uh, GSCAN study has more than 1 million subjects for alcohol uh, consumption. The QF measurement uh, measures get much of their information from normal range variation. Uh, instead, alcohol use disorder or problematic alcohol use is more um, physiological. And in this study, we only focus on European samples because in previous published studies, less than 3% of subjects are uh, of non-European ancestry. This is the, this is the study design. Uh, we did proxy phenotype meta-analysis for PAU, combining four data sets. The first is MVP phase one. The second is the new sample from MVP phase two. Uh, the phenotype is alcohol use disorder. And we meta-analyzed uh, alcohol use disorder with the DGC alcohol dependence because the genetic correlation between them are close to one. And the genetic correlation between AUD and UK Bank ODP is 0.71 just find the uh, meta-analysis. So for the total discovery sample, we have more than 435,000 
subject. We identified 42 needs needs. After conditional analysis, there are 29 independent signals. Uh, among them, 19 are novel in European um, populations. The sleep-based habitability is uh, about 7%. Six, uh, 66 genes have been identified to be associated with acute use disorder or problematic acute use. Here I missed some important genes which might be important uh, or be interested for downstream analysis. As expected, uh, the CNS or uh, central uh, nervous system is the most enriched cell type group uh, by LD score regression. And the GTAC tissue expression enrichment shows that most of those brain uh, tissues are enriched. So it's it indicates that acute use disorder or problematic acute use is uh, more like a brain disease. So we applied film-wide association analysis using the PAU PRS in another biobank, the BioVU. The sample size is more than uh, 67,000. It shows that most of those mental disorders are uh, uh, associated with uh, the PRS. And this study was made by Julie, uh, Junior and me. Um, PAU is genetically correlated with a lot of traits, including substance use, risk behavior, psychiatric disease, and other traits. For the first time, we tried to uh, infer the, the genetic causality between acute use uh, disorder and other traits using bi-directional Mendelian randomization. The hypothesis here is whether those genetically correlated traits have um, uh, causal effects or uh, outcome uh, from acute uh, use disorder. Um, after filtering, we, uh, uh, for the exposures, we filtered the traits with more than 10 independent uh, instruments. And to be clear, actually here we only uh, analyzed the acute use disorder to avoid sample overlap. In total, 38 hypotheses were tested, so we, uh, we did buffalo correction, and four methods were applied. So here I list the traits uh, which uh, have been a causal effect by at least one method and consistent for the directions of the effects but all four methods. For example, drinks per week has um, weak evidence uh, that uh, has causal effects to the uh, genetic liability of acute use disorder. And four methods, uh, all of those four methods are significant. And ever smoked regularly and other uh, traits shows evidence of causality. Um, interestingly, cognitive, uh, cognitive performance uh, educational attainment uh, has negative uh, effects on the uh, acute use disorder uh, genetic liability. And we tested the reverse um, relationship. Um, drinks per week um, and educational attainment um, shows uh, weak evidence that um, acute use disorder has causal effect on that. And here is the summary. Uh, we did math analysis for PAU, the sample size is more than 400,000 subjects, which is much larger than previous math analysis. In total, we identified 29 uh, risk variants, 19 of them are novel, and we did a lot of functional enrichment, and it shows that uh, uh, brain regions are enriched. And uh, genetic correlations uh, analysis shows that AUD or PAU is um, uh, related to a lot of psychiatric, medical, and health outcomes. And for the first time, we uh, inferred the possible uh, causal effects on the risk of PAU and AUD. Of course, we have a lot of limitations. One of the most important limitations is that um, we still lack of non-European subjects. And I would, like, I would like to thank all the participants and thank all the co-authors and funding agency. And that's it. Thank you. We'll move right to Emma now. Um, 
Okay. Thanks, Hong and Howard. Um, so today I'm gonna to be sharing some work that we've done looking at a cross disorder analysis of alcohol use disorder and schizophrenia. And I wanna start with three general observations. So we know that schizophrenia is a fairly rare disorder, um, but within this group of individuals, the prevalence of alcohol use disorder and other SUDs is quite high. And this dual diagnosis is associated with a host of negative consequences, including longer hospital stays, higher rates of incarceration, uh, lower treatment success, and uh, medication compliance. And up to 60% of early deaths in individuals with schizophrenia, we can at least partially attribute to the use problem. And there are several um, theories for what might underlie this comorbidity, and of course these aren't mutually exclusive. One idea is that individuals with schizophrenia might turn to alcohol and other substances to try and alleviate some of their symptoms or to try and alleviate the side effects of antipsychotics. There could be shared environmental risk factors that contribute to both schizophrenia and alcohol use disorder. Um, some of the impairments in cognitive processes that are often associated with schizophrenia might contribute to an increased risk of developing AUD. But there's also some evidence that there might be shared genetic pathways underlying these two disorders, and so that's what I'm going to focus on today. Both of these disorders are moderately, at least moderately, heritable, um, and recent GWAS of alcohol dependence and AUD have identified significant genetic correlations with schizophrenia. Um, so the statistic that I have up here, this is from the um, GWAS of AUD in the Million Veteran Program sample from Kranzler et al. that came out last year. And they identified a modest genetic heritability or genetic correlation of about 0.34, highly significant. And studies of polygenic risk scores of AUD have also shown that these are associated with increased uh, liability for schizophrenia and vice versa. But when we look at the genetic relationship between schizophrenia and quantitative measures of more typical alcohol consumption, this tends to be um, quite weak. So, for example, I'm showing here the genetic correlation between drinks per week from the G-Scan GWAS that came out last year by Lou et al. And they found a genetic correlation of about 0.01, non-significant. So the aims of the current study were, first of all, uh, simply to identify variants with both pleiotropic as well as disorder-specific effects, as well as to um, connect that to expression data. Second, we wanted to partition the genetic covariance into relevant functional categories as well as specific genomic regions. We wish to examine whether there was any evidence for a causal relationship between these two disorders. And finally, um, actually contrast the genetic relationship between schizophrenia and alcohol use disorder with that for schizophrenia and a measure of more typical alcohol intake drinks per week. So during this talk, I'll quickly go through um, these four aims in order. I um, want to point out for AIM-1, I'm really excited to present some newish results from our African ancestry samples, thanks to the GPC. Uh, finish with some next steps for this project and a quick summary. So AIM-1, to identify variants with both pleiotropic as well as disorder-specific effects, we're using an approach called ASSET, and then I'll um, explain how we're connecting this to expression data. Starting with our European ancestry samples for schizophrenia, we're using um, the PGC GWAS summary statistics uh, for phase three. Um, this was a lead with um, non-European ancestry individuals or those with um, obvious overlap with data sets in the alcohol dependence GWAS from the PGC. For alcohol use disorder, I meta-analyzed the alcohol dependence GWAS from Walters et al with the AUD GWAS from the MVP. And then we also contrasted this with the G-Scan drinks per week GWAS. ASSET is a really nice approach for this type of cross disorder analysis because we're not only able to identify SNPs with concordant effects, so the same direction of effect on both disorders, but we can also identify SNPs with discordant effects. Um, so a SNP that has an effect on both AUD and schizophrenia, but it in, in the opposite direction. And so we input both the AUD and the schizophrenia summary statistics into ASSET, and this is what we find. And this looks like a typo, but I promise it's not. So we identified 48 um, independent loci with concordant effects, so either a risk effect on both disorders or a protective effect, 
and 48 loci with uh, discordant effects on these disorders, as well as some schizophrenia-specific variants and AUD-specific loci. We then input this into the uh, FUMA platform from Daniel Postuma's lab, and this is um, from the MAGMA gene-based test. So this is for the concordant subset of SNPs with the same direction of effect on both disorders. And when we take the top 10 genes from this analysis and do a quick VWAS lookup in the GWAS atlas, um, also from Daniel Postuma's lab, we see that these genes have been previously suggested for schizophrenia and various alcohol-related phenotypes, so this is reassuring. Um, they're also uh, associated with traits like educational attainment, ADHD, neuroticism, and a number of um, risk-taking or externalizing related phenotypes. Now I'll go through the same thing for the discordant subset of SNPs. When we look at these top 10 genes, again, we see schizophrenia and alcohol-related phenotypes, as well as some other relevant interesting phenotypes, including educational attainment, some reproductive phenotypes, and uh, smoking behaviors. The gene property analysis, um, which is run through MAGMA on the FUMA platform, again, implicated brain tissues. And then I also ran a pathway analysis using Pascal to try and um, get a bit more at some of the underlying biology here. And we do identify two significant pathways for the concordant subset of SNPs, one pathway relating to developmental biology processes and the other related to axonal guidance. Um, one, one significant pathway for the schizophrenia-specific SNPs, but we didn't find anything for discordant or AED-specific variants. Um, this is some work that Dr. Manav Kapoor has uh, conducted for us. Uh, the first database Mendelian randomization analysis. So this is um, in uh, genes expressed in brain tissue. And these top genes are associated both, um, they're concordant for AED and schizophrenia and linked to uh, gene expression in the brain. And a lot of these genes have been previously implicated for schizophrenia, BMI, and um, several immunological traits. Manav also looked at some differential gene expression data uh, in schizophrenia brains compared to controls and a sample of AUD brains compared to controls. And we do see some enrichment of the concordant subset of genes in the um, differential expression data from schizophrenia individuals compared to controls, but not in the AUD sample. And now I'm gonna present the African ancestry results. Um, as you can see, unfortunately, we're quite underpowered here. So for schizophrenia, we're using summary statistics from the GPC, thanks to uh, Tim Bigdelli for contributing those. And for AUD, again, I'm meta-analyzing the alcohol dependence GWAS from PGC and the AUD GWAS from the MVP sample. Um, we, again, are underpowered, but we did identify some significant genes in the gene-based analysis. Uh, for the discordant subset, ADH1B is in there, um, which is somewhat interesting. We also identified some AUD-only genes and schizophrenia-specific genes. Unfortunately, I think a lot of this is being driven by our AUD sample, so it would be great if we had more schizophrenia samples. Um, but at the moment, I think our next step is to conduct a transancestral analysis. For the second aim, um, and just a note, the rest of what I'm going to present is on the European ancestry subset only. Here, I was interested in partitioning the genetic covariance into relevant functional categories and specific regions using um, software called Genova and Rojas. And these are the results from Genova. Um, so on the right here in this table, we have the genetic covariance stratified by functional and non-functional regions of the genome. And both of these are significant, um, but the concentration of the genetic covariance is nearly twice as high in the non-functional regions compared to the functional regions of the genome. On the left, this figure is showing the genetic covariance stratified by broad tissue type. And so we see that this is significant in um, brain tissues. And we do see a bit of um, suggestive enrichment in immune tissues, but this did not pass multiple testing corrections. And I want to point out this dotted line here. Um, this is showing the genetic covariance for drinks per week in schizophrenia, also stratified by tissue type, and we see that this is not significantly um, concentrated in any particular tissue. These are the Rojas results. Um, so this is showing the genetic correlation or covariance stratified by um, 
negative covariance at the region immediately adjacent to ADH1B. So this was also identified in the asset analyses. And these two bottom panels are also somewhat interesting. This is the local SNP heritability for AUD in schizophrenia. And so you see this um, very low level amount of heritability for AUD across the genome, except for this really large proportion of heritability at the ADH1B locus. AIM-3, I wanted to examine whether there's any evidence for a causal relationship between these two disorders. And to do this, we use latent causal variable analysis. So this is um, a bit of an alternative to more tra traditional Mendelian randomization approaches. Um, the hope here is that we will identify fewer false positives in the presence of genetic correlations and pleiotropy and highly polygenic traits. And so the z-score for partial genetic causality is about one. We see that the p-value for the null hypothesis that there's no genetic causality between these two traits um, is 0.3, so we cannot reject that null hypothesis. And the p-values for the uh, proportion of genetic causality being fully causal um, are highly significant. So there's not really much evidence of a causal relationship here. Um, finally, I was interested in looking at the genetic relationship between schizophrenia and drinks per week and schizophrenia AUD in more detail. As I mentioned earlier in the G-SCAN paper, they found no evidence of a genetic correlation between schizophrenia and drinks per week, but I plan to recalculate that using these new schizophrenia phase three summary statistics. And when I did this, um, the genetic correlation is about almost 0.1, um, and it's actually significant now. And the genetic correlation between AUD and schizophrenia is 0.38, highly significant. And these two things are actually different when we test these. So next steps for this project, um, and in general, first of all, AUD is a highly polygenic trait. We know this now. Um, we really need larger sample sizes. And I think one thing I've alluded to in this presentation, and Hong pointed out in his as well, um, AUD and alcohol dependence are not the same thing as drinks per week and other quantity frequency measures. Um, so while those are much easier to collect for these large sample sizes, we really need cases of substance use disorders. It would also be nice to have more informative samples to try and disentangle some possible confounding factors here. For instance, it would be really nice to know how many of these schizophrenia cases also have AUD or other substance use disorders. So if there's any way we can start getting at that information, that would be great. And of course, I'd still like to know more about the underlying biology here. But quick summary, um, we did identify both concordant and discordant pleiotropic SNPs as well as disorder-specific SNPs. We identified some significant pathways for the concordant SNPs and as well as some possible enrichment in schizophrenia um, brains compared to controls when we look at differentially expressed genes. It's less obvious at the moment what the discordant SNPs represent. And of course, our African ancestry samples are under. It's really uh, when we look at the genetic covariance between AUD and schizophrenia, we see enrichment in brain tissues um, with some evidence of enrichment in immune related tissues. And schizophrenia does appear to share less overlap with alcohol consumption than disordered drinking. And finally, there is not really much support for causal relationships, at least when we look at our samples. So thanks to all these individuals and these funding agencies. And thank you, Emma. And we'll move right on to Renato and again get to questions at the very end. So Renato. Good morning, everyone. So now you should see my screen. That is, okay, yes, full screen. So I'm going to talk about, I'm Renato Polimanti, I work at Yale. Some of you know me. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, PGC effort to investigate the difference between opioid use and opioid dependence. So the first thing that I have to say is that uh, for these traits, we don't have large sample size. So what I'm going to show is that teeny tiny uh, GWOS with respect to the one that Hema and uh, Hang discussed. So uh, first, this is my conflict of interest. As we know, opioid hemitepics uh, is, a, is a, a trend in the news, uh, and it's because uh, the uh, opioid overdose deaths are rising in the US, uh, and uh, the CDC identified three wave of, uh, of increase in the opioid overdose deaths. So one due to prescription opioid, one due to heroin, and one due uh, to synthetic opioids. And right now in the US, we have 130 Americans that die every day for opioid overdose. And uh, 
right now there is uh, the new NIH Hill uh, helping to end addiction long term and one of the main aim is to investigate uh, opioid and to address opioid epidemics. However, in human genetics, we don't have right now the resources to investigate uh, uh, the genetic architecture of opioids related traits. These are the GWOs that uh, were conducted in the past year from 2014, uh, the first opioid dependent GWOs, to 2018. And as you can see, the sample size is really small. We have genome wise linear findings, but we are well aware that these findings are not reliable because they are not stable and probably there is a stronger false positive rate among these findings. So in 2019, two opioid uh, GWOs came out. One from, was from the PGC Substance Use Disorder Work Group, is the one that I'm presenting today. And the goal was to investigate the difference between opioid use and opioid dependence. Because as we are uh, starting to understand dependence and consumption, they are different uh, for a, a, a drug, uh, in drug addiction. And the second one is from the Million Veteran Program. Hang is the main analyst of this project. So uh, there is an overlap because Galenter Group is involved in, in, in leading both. And this other G was, was focused only to investigate opioid dependence. So I'm going to talk about uh, the PGC analysis. And uh, first of all, we have to consider that opioid genetics run out is deep in the death zone. So as you will know, the there are different phases in a GWOS, depending on the simple size, the number of cases. And uh, right now, for, uh, uh, right now for uh, uh, opioid genetics, uh, we are uh, in the dead zone. I don't know if you see my pointer, I hope so. Uh, so uh, we don't have the simple size to identify a meaningful number of genome-wide significant loci and to identify the polygenic architecture of these traits. However, we can start to investigate the difference between opioid use and opioid dependence. There is a, a, a small caveat because opioid exposure can be due to two different mechanisms. One is the use of illicit drugs and one is the use of prescript uh, drug. And the other thing that opioid exposure per se can be also a, 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 an important trait with a different genetic architecture. And in previous GWOs, we have different design. In some cases, we have that uh, opioid dependence were uh, compared to opioid exposed controls. In other cases, with opioid unexposed controls. And this, as we will see, we can make a big difference. So this is the sample size and the different cores that were included in, in our analysis. We have over 40,000 participants overall, uh, 4,500 cases, 4,100 exposed controls, 32,000, more than 32,000 unexposed controls. However, as you can see, and we have both uh, um, individuals of European descent and African descent, but as you can see, the sample size per court is pretty small. And if you are familiar with how many courts we have available in the PGC SUD group, you can see that this is a small subset. And these are the only courts that we have right now that they have information about opioid, as opioid use and dependence assessed with the DSM-4 uh, criteria. So in some cases, we had to be careful because as you can see, the number of cases is pretty small. We had to be careful about deflation and possible bias to, to this difference between case uh, and controls uh, uh, sample size. So we conducted three different tests. Uh, the first one is the most strict, uh, is to compare opioid dependence versus opioid exposure. And we think this is the one that can really give us information about dependence because it's adjusted for the opioid exposure. The second one is to compare opioid dependence versus opioid unexposed controls and see what we can see different between the exposed analysis and the unexposed analysis. And then we have the third test that is comparing opioid exposed controls, so people without the dependence, but they, they had a lifetime exposure to opioids versus opioid unexposed controls. So, uh, as you can imagine, from a tiny GWOS comparing 40,000 cases and 40,000 controls, we didn't find anything when we compare opioid dependent cases versus exposed controls. And I think this is a good sign because it uh, means that our analysis is stable and unfortunately there are any large effect variant in the related to opioid dependence. So, uh, however, when we compare opioid dependent cases versus opioid and exposed controls, 
we identified two signals in the African-American participants. So we find a variant in chromosome 18 and also a gene-based association in chromosome 18. And later we will see how reliable is this variant. And then we did also enrichment analysis and the irritability estimate. This was a really small, so as you can see, this is the analysis comparing opioid-dependent cases and unexposed controls. We have a nominally significant irritability, uh, about uh, 28, uh, between 28 and 50%, depending if you're considering only European ancestors or the trans ancestry meta-analysis. But as you can see, the standard error is pretty large, so we cannot use all the fancy methods that are available right now for uh, GWAS analysis, so we cannot do genetic correlation, we cannot do um, stratified irritability analysis. However, we can do an enrichment analysis considering different stages of brain development. And when we compare opioid dependent cases versus unexposed controls, we found an enrichment for adult and ado adolescent uh, brain stages. But then when we did uh, the analysis comparing exposed versus unexposed controls, we found something different. The enrichment is for uh, weeks after conception, so 9th, 8th, and 12th. So this means that there could be a difference in the brain mechanism differentiated opioid dependence and opioid exposure. In the GWAS analysis for this trait, in the European participants, we found a gene-based association that survived multiple uh, testing correction, there was banned for uh, JIT. And in the same gene, there was a variant that was close to the genome-wide significant level. So for this variant, uh, we tested if uh, the variant was affecting the expression of, of this gene. So there is a relationship. And this is, these are data from uh, the GTEx uh, consortium, and this is uh, the multi-tissue EQTL analysis. So here you can see different tissue, and then uh, the p-value reported here is the p-value across this tissue, and here in this plot on the right, you can see the posterior probability for each tissue. So we have some brain tissue. However, the strongest results is for adipose tissue. However, when we look to another gene that is regulated by this variant, SLC30A9, we find a stronger AQTL signal, and this is a brain AQTL, because if you see here, in the figure on the right, you will see that tissue with the posterior probability greater than 0.9, 90%, they are all brain tissue. So we believe that this is the gene that is affecting uh, the opioid exposure phenotype. So then we did the, the exposed versus unexposed controls in the trans ancestry meta analysis. We found a uh, significant signal in the SNP-based analysis, and one interesting gene-based association. Uh, I wasn't aware about these genes, but uh, fortunately, on the GWAS catalog, catalog uh, SDCCA G9 gene is a pretty famous gene. It was identified by 42 uh, studies. Uh, they reported a total of 52 uh, genome-wide significant association, and we have some uh, known phenotypes like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, educational attainment, cognitive ability, but there are also uh, some physical uh, health traits like ob obesity and uh, diastolic blood pressure. So it's between mental and physical health and it would be interesting to understand why this gene is linked to opioid dependence, mental health and physical health. So we obviously, uh, due to the lack of samples, we don't have uh, a replication sample. So we use the UK Biobank to conduct a phenome-wide analysis. So we consider all the 40,000 traits, uh, a total of 361,000 individuals. And we have different evidence for the three single variants that we identified. So for the variant associated uh, RS929121, the one high on the left, we identified a total of 27 uh, phenome-wide significant uh, association. And in the next slide, I will show you what are the categories. For the variant that was associated with opioid dependence versus unexposed control, so we have a total of five phenome-wide significant variants. And for the last variant, the one on the bottom left, you will see that we don't even find any phenome-wide significant association. So this could be a way to identify if the variant that we observed are uh, meaningful variant that they were associated with something else that could be closely related to opioid use or opioid dependence, or they are not, so there is probably a false positive result here. So we have two possible candidates. So let's see which are these 
phenom-wide association. So for the variant that were associated with uh, between exposed and unexposed controls, we found the phenotypic association for uh, uh, dietary supplement intake, uh, anthropomedic traits, behavioral trait. The strongest one was neuroticism that we know is well uh, is associated with uh, several psychiatric disorder and substance use disorder. Physical outcomes, reproductive function, and cognitive test. For the second variant, uh, that was associated in the analysis between opioid dependence and unexposed controls, we found several associations related to musculoskeletal disorder. Uh, musculoskeletal disorder is one of the leading causes of chronic pain, and we know that uh, one of the ways to develop opioid dependence is through pain management, so uh, prescription opioid that can lead to dependence and so uh, to addiction. And, uh, so it's, it's pretty interesting, but however, the sample size in our analysis is too small, so there will, we will need more sample to confirm these results and to go deep in the possible biological mechanism. So um, as you was, uh, opioid dependence, opioid exposure, they are pretty small for gene discovery, but we can use them for a polygenic risk score analysis. We focus only on related European subjects. Here are the cohorts included with the different sample size. And uh, we focus only because uh, we don't have a, a high power, statistical power, so we focus on two traits. The first one is risk tolerance, because we know that is associated with uh, substance use, substance ex exposure, and substance dependence. This is the result from the Social Science Genetic Association Consortium, so it's a pretty strong GWAS. So we did our analysis, and uh, here I'm presenting the results in a slightly different way. Of the, with respect to the one we are used for PRS, and there is a reason. So we are on the x-axis, we have the effective set of size. On the y-axis, we have the z-score for the PRS, and we have the different three categories. So opioid dependence versus opioid exposure in red, opioid dependence versus opioid unexposed in blue, and opioid exposure versus opioid unexposed in green. So you can see that there is a trend increasing the sample size. They tend to, uh, uh, for all these traits to be associated with, uh, with risk-taking behavior and opioid phenotypes. And the trend is in line with the effective sample size. So here in the diamond, we have the meta-analysis results and in two cases survived multiple testing correction. When the sample size was smaller, the results didn't survive, but was nominally significant. So for all the traits tested, we have that there is the same positive association within, with the risk tolerance PRS. So the second one uh, of the trade that we test is uh, neuroticism. So this is another uh, large GWAS, and we know that neuroticism is associated with dependence, is genetically correlated with dependence, depression, post-traumatic stress. So it's interesting to see how different is the association of this trait with uh, opioid-related traits that we investigated. So in this case, we found a difference, and the difference is not explained by sample size because the largest effective sample size is for the opioid exposure phenotype. So exposed controls versus unexposed controls. And there was a null result actually in a negative association. A negative association we also observed, observed in the single variant association because the variant RS929121 was negative associated with the, uh, opioid exposure and positive associated with neuroticism score. Instead, for the two opioid dependence phenotype, based on exposed controls and unexposed controls, we both found significant association. And there is no heterogeneity across the course that we investigated. So the, the different design of the course is not affecting uh, our, our finding. So in this case, we found that the component that is shared between neuroticism and opioid dependence is different from the component shared with the opioid exposure. So these are the first findings that are a difference between exposure and dependence to opioids. Obviously, these are really uh, not preliminary results, but the results are strongly limited by the sample size. We need much larger sample size to investigate these complex traits. The preprint of this study with much more details about what we did is on my archive. We have a provisional acceptance of molecular psychiatry. We are waiting for, uh, for finalizing the, 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 the files. So I have to thank uh, all the PGC and the SUD work group. This is a, a collaborative effort and obviously NIDA and MH and IEEE that are funding these studies. Thank you. Thank you, Renato. Um, so you've heard three snapshots of what the substance use dependence group has been doing 
Uh, we're looking at a range of substances. You, <clears throat> we didn't have time to present what we're doing on cannabis. A couple of things you see go across all of these presentations. One is, as for most of the PGC, we need larger sample sizes and more diverse samples. And that's uh, one reason for, for talking with all of you is to encourage you to look at your data and see if you have things that will help. The other thing, which again is cutting across many of these uh, different substances of, uh, uh, that cause these substance use disorders, is that we can't get away just asking, have you ever tried this? Have you ever had a drink? How much do you drink? We really need the data on problems at the minimum and ideally on diagnoses. Uh, you saw from uh, Hung stuff that uh, if you get a clear enough problem uh, set, like the audit P and Abraham Palmer and, and some others have shown this also, you can, you can work with those data, uh, but quantity frequency is not enough. Uh, you've, you already know uh, that there's a lot of comorbidity and what you can see is we're trying in collaboration with a number of the different groups to try to pick apart the genetics of this and see uh, see how they're related, uh, look for causal uh, impacts in both directions. So I think this has given you a flavor of what we're doing. I'd like to open up the floor to um, any questions which you can type into the chat box or uh, perhaps Tammy can forward them. So far, it's quiet. I think the, the, there were three very compelling presentations. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions yet. Uh, I, I should just generally uh, throw out again the idea of having everyone look through what they're currently doing to see what data they have. And as you're talking with your colleagues and trying to increase the sample size of all of the other uh, PGC disorders, um, we'd really like you to send forward this message that the problematic use and the disorder, the substance use disorders, is something that they ought to really evaluate and not try to, uh, and not ignore this. Uh, alcohol use, uh, other substance uses, uh, misuses, really impacts pretty much every disease. So um, there's a question from ARPANA to everybody, in case you're not looking at your chats, about how can we increase the sample size for opioids? Uh, there, the comorbidity with other PGC groups may not be as high, although, again, until we look at it, we're not, we're not as sure as we'd like to be about that. If, so if you have any thoughts, please uh, ra raise your hand here and or email any of us. Yeah, if I can add, uh, like, uh, the problem with the opioid is it is uh, the both export and dependence, the dependence is not really high, so all these biobanks, uh, both MVP, we have like uh, around uh, 10,000 uh, subjects and 70,000 exposed controls, but uh, it will not be enough uh, to understand, like to, to really do a powerful GPOs for these traits. So also the other uh, uh, biobanks, they are much smaller, like the institutional biobanks, maybe putting together all this data, they can push a little bit, but maybe there will be need of more recruitment. And uh, yes, I see a question that proposed methadone clinics. That could be a nice thing, but it will require like a lot of organization because it should be done across different centers. So yes. and, and one point about that, uh, and again, Eli, it's a great point about the methadone clinics. And I know there's a big one uh, associated with, uh, well, there's several big ones in New York associated with your group. Uh, one of the issues is unfortunately some of the NIH agencies are not particularly happy about funding new collection grants at the moment. And so as you're talking with people in agencies, that, that's another thing to think about. So there is a, another question about uh, using opioids, uh, investigating opioid using EHR data. And uh, like the MVP study is based on the EHR data. 
So, and there was a, an, an entire algorithm to identify the opioid exposed uh, and dependence. I don't know if Fango wants to say something about it uh, because he's the main analyst. Um, yes. Um, uh, basically, we just use the ICD uh, code to diagnose the uh, uh, opioid use disorder. And in our study, we, uh, we use uh, an algorithm which did by Chris, uh, Christopher uh, to define the opioid exposed controls, I think which is very important for uh, substance uh, use. Um, I think I remember someone asked the, asked the same question about the, the, the coding or the algorithm to define um, uh, opioids through EHR. Um, uh, I, we just use the ICD code. For example, one inpatient or uh, at least two outpatient ICD code for OUD. Um, I'm not sure um, if, they, if, if there any other way um, to use the EHR phenotype. So if I can add, uh, like uh, with the experience that we are having in MVP, because we have also both self-reported and for some traits, not for opioid, unfortunately, self-reported uh, and uh, EHR uh, phenotypes, uh, we find a strong genetic correlation between the two. So probably it's the same also for opioids. Uh, this, this means that uh, both the EHR data, when the sample size is large enough, can be highly informative. But uh, the problem with opioids is that prevalence uh, probably is not going to be really high until we don't go like for methadone clinics center that have high prevalence to, for treat this, this disorder. And also you uh, should keep in mind that the volunteer kinds of panels, uh, 23andMe, UK Biobank, are going to be heavily underrepresented in people with opioid dependence or some of the other substance dependence. Um, it's just a, a, a much healthier, higher SES group. I think Christopher is online and uh, Christopher, if you want, you can discuss a little bit about the, uh, the morphine equivalent metric that you use and why it wasn't good for, for a genetic analysis. Uh, actually, we tested the, um, the trajectory of morphine, uh, trajectory of opioid use is on the morphine equivalent daily dose. However, um, there's no signal so um, in, in MVP, probably we need um, not the same size to um, analyze this. Christopher, you can. Yeah, sorry, I, I somebody just had to give me the uh, power to talk on this webinar. So yeah, we did, we have an algorithm that we defined in the Veterans Aging Cohort Study looking at all of the outpatient prescriptions of opioids uh, grabbing all of their doses and converting them to morphine equivalent daily doses. Uh, and that's what I think Hong was mentioning is that we did try to use that uh, in, um, in GWAS in many different forms, taking metrics like mean, median, mode, et cetera, maximum um, over the course of follow-up in the EHR, as well as this trajectory analysis using morphine equivalents as well. But none of those proved to be any, uh, to have much utility given our sample sizes in, in MVP. And, and that makes things because MVP right now is the largest biobank in the world. So this means that biobanks uh, is, is not going to be the solution to tackle uh, opioid yeah. genetics. Uh, yeah. Although as you get more and more of them, it will certainly help and it'll help parse out the interrelationships with other uh, traits. And that's where I think it'll be particularly valuable. Yeah. yeah so, uh, other questions? Well, we've argued for a long time that directed recruitment is necessary. And if you look at the summary that Renato showed of the source of the subjects included in the PGC meta-analysis, that's where they came from. Mm -hmm. There's just not another good way that we have identified so far. There was a comment from Eli Stahl, why not recruit at methadone maintenance clinics? And that's actually a great idea, and we've tried to do that. But one issue is that there are usually administrative um, barriers between opioid substitution therapy clinics and 
ordinary uh, mental health clinics, and even the EHRs are separate. So we have not yet been able to surmount that barrier. Um, but um, I think that's a good possibility because if you're in a methadone maintenance clinic and you're on methadone, even if you weren't opioid dependent when you enrolled for methadone maintenance, you are now. Okay, we have uh, maybe two minutes left if there are any other uh, pressing questions. Well, I don't see any, so thank you all. And uh, again, thanks to the three presenters who I think- I think we have another question from uh, Abe about the control group for from clinics. Ah, okay. It's popped up. Yeah, that's, that's always going to be an issue. Uh, if one has enough other kinds of data, particularly in the same cities and the like, you can presumably match on a bunch of other um, traits, uh, age, sex, SES type things, um, and potentially, depending on how much data you have, I think there are ways of, of uh, creating a control group. It, it, it will be a challenge, eh? Yeah. But I think it's surmountable. Okay, well, so this is a good time to thank everyone for their attendance. And um, seeing no other questions, shall we um, end the session? Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye all. Bye. Bye. Bye.